A warm welcome to all our viewers to our series Natural Medicine. I recently had the great honor and pleasure to have a movement expert here in the studio. I think he really is an incredibly meaningful person who has helped so many people to get out of the pain of the musculoskeletal system. And he once said a line in a sentence which was that surgeries often do more harm than good. And I'd like to take up that as a topic again today. It's a pleasure for me to have Karl Müller back here in the studio today. Warm welcome, dear Carl. Thanks, Alexander. Well, if I may say, you're a hero to me, a real hero. How many millions of people today have less pain or no pain thanks to this great idea of putting nature back under people's feet? Yeah, thanks for the word hero, but that's not my credit. That's a gift from God that I received that, and it is also very obliging. For example, I am obliged to still be active, even at almost 70 or 69 years of age. But it is a great pleasure when I see how many people approach me, how many hundreds and thousands of emails and feedback we get. There are statements from customers like, he saved my life. That would be the last thing I would give up, and so on. That is also a great pleasure. I don't see myself as a hero at all, but simply as someone who does what he was given to do in life. It was also my word which I find appropriate, because when you have done so much good and helped people so much, then you really deserve to hear this from me. So please accept it. I think it's fantastic. I also know from the magazines, from Google, that the Pope was already in touch with you. Ronaldo was in touch with you. I think 10 million shoes are already out there with this technology that you developed. So I think it's amazing. But today, I want to dive into the surgeries. I once worked with a clinic and they showed me figures showing how explosively surgeries in orthopedics are expanding and how quickly the surgery is carried out. They can hardly keep up with so many operations in this regard. And in our first show, you said it hurts your heart to see and hear that because most of them could be prevented. And I'd like to ask you to explain this to me a little more in detail. Yeah, you just have to look a bit beyond what is actually behind the pain. What is happening that humans degenerate so quickly? Many people already have knee and hip problems at the age of 50 or 60 and then just have surgeries done, although there are alternatives, which would be very simple and also not that destructive for the body, because if the fascia apparatus is cut, the onboard computer, so to speak, is destroyed. And that's only the beginning. One operation leads to another. And if you look at this animation here, you can see on the left a relatively soft gym floor, a shoe, a, a very flexible shoe, a sneaker. And if you look at the thighs now, then you can see that the thigh muscles that would have to control the movement, the muscles are what makes the movement. Now, these thigh muscles lose fractions of a second. These are recordings at 800 frames per second. So here I see the muscle extremely, you can see the muscle shaking off. Now it gets hit back and forth. It loses control of the movement. And you have to imagine, this happens with every single step. And that gives you blows up here in the hip. There is when the muscles lose control of the joint. 
So the joint shakes around for fractions of a second. And with every single step, with 10,000 steps a day, that's 10,000 joint overloads in the knee. And what happens in the knee, of course, also happens in the hips and the back. And I hope you can see that clearly in the direction. These images of the muscle lashing out there. Exactly. This is the quad, the four-headed hamstring muscle. Quadriceps. One part shakes the whole muscle around. And you can see that. These are blows. These are massive blows. And if these blows really have happened for 10 or 20 years now, then that's 50 million blows. And there you can imagine what happens in that knee, in the menisci. The knee is a very special joint. It, it's like rollers, inside and outside, like, like rollers. So this is not just a, a, a bearing with an axis that's always in the same place, but the axis moves forward. There are buffers in between. This is the outer and inner meniscus, which are also hung in a very complex way. They have to be adjusted with the movement of the foot. And the foot, which moves from the supination in the rear area, so one begins to put the foot slightly on the outside, then it turns inwards over the big toe. And this movement, as God has intended, is linked with the knee. But if the foot movement doesn't just, if the foot only folds down, as you can see here, and it doesn't even fold that fast here, because there is a relatively cushioning floor and then it cushions it, then you have to imagine that there is, of course, wear and tear in the menisci. The menisci are damaged and cartilage wears out, damages itself through this unnatural impact on the hard, flat ground. Actually, we used to run barefoot. I'll say it's an evolution now. At some point, there might have been leather soles, but we've always been closely connected to the earth. One thing is the shoes, yeah. But what is much more important than the shoes is the floor. When the ground's so flat and hard everywhere, that's happening. If the ground was uneven, when we go barefoot in the meadow or barefoot on gravel, or barefoot anywhere, barefoot on stones, on different natural soils, then that would never happen, because we put the foot down carefully, unconsciously, sure. And then that doesn't happen in the knee. And if you look at the picture on the right, we now have a, a, a buffer in there. Nothing happens there, the whole, that's completely stable. Amazing. When you don't have a normal shoe with a hard sole between your foot and the ground, but just a... Uh, just an elastic springy, not simply soft sole, that's of no use. Because the soft sole, or simply comfortable shoes, they don't train the foot. They, they might cushion this blow a little. You can see that with these relatively soft sneakers. They, they cushion it a bit, but they don't train the foot for strength, flexibility and balance. And even worse happens in the long run, because when you're wearing soft, comfortable shoes, then the body, the entire sequence of movements, the control and regulation via the brain, via the fascia apparatus, Golgis, Rufinis, Pacinis, all of how we move is controlled and regulated. These automatisms become even more convenient, so the foot learns to move even less actively. But if you have something like a trampoline, so a, a springy material between the feet and the ground, then the, the muscles learn to move actively and to control the joints so that they are physiologically, which means naturally, in the form in which they are actually intended to be weighted. And then you've actually solved the problem. Let's go up there a little more. So, also the hips. With this, let's say with this scientific shoe, which has this cushioning technique built in, 
The whole musculoskeletal system is relieved of blows. That said, someone with painful hips could actually walk a lot better now with, with a lot less pain, or even no more pain. Yeah, of course, of course. Maybe that doesn't work from one day to the next. Yeah, because the inflammation has to subside. If there is inflammation, it's a different topic, but then inflammations can subside faster if there is not always a stimulus, like on the left. And of course, inflammation can subside better if new stimuli don't keep coming. That's one way inflammation will subside. But that's another topic with blood circulation, with lymph activity and so on. But what you see mechanically here is that on the right hip is pushed further forward. The pelvis becomes more upright. And of course, the hips are also weighted differently. There's also more movement in the hips. Maybe we'll see later how it works. But in the end, I, I just want to say, what are the causes? that are behind orthopedic problems, knee problems, hip problems, foot problems. And there are causes, and they come from everyday life. The hard, flat floors, the blows are one thing. And sitting is another thing. We're sitting here now too. At home, I don't have any chairs. So at the dining table, that's where I eat. Sometimes I eat in the chair, mostly on the floor. I lived in South Korea for 20 years. I'm used to sitting cross-legged in the lotus position at a small table. And otherwise, either I, I walk, I work on the treadmill, or I sit on the floor. But sitting is another thing too. Maybe there will be a show about it, an episode about the fascia. There are statements in newspapers that the hole you sat through the day can't be compensated by exercising in the evening. This has to do with fascial adhesions. No matter how much I exercise in the evening, it can no longer be compensated for. So you should behave differently in everyday life. Walk differently, sit differently, sit less, stand. But just standing like that is not that healthy either. In our new studio, we'll be standing up. Great, great. So this picture is totally convincing. But now I still ask myself, when I see the picture, how does the body actually behave when walking? I mean, many people tend to lean forward over time. The head goes backwards again and so on. Everything has to be in balance somehow. The best way to see it is when you move one side further. We've prepared that here. Now, it would be another one back. Yes, exactly, this slide. Now, when this starts to move, then you see here, maybe you can get everything moving. Exactly, the, the left skeleton is the physiological walk. Mm -hmm. This is also the walk that corresponds to this Maasai warrior. You can see the activity of the feet of, of this Maasai warrior, and you can also see how upright he is. Yes, it's elegant, extremely upright. And the skeleton, by the way, we, we made these ourselves in our laboratory. We also have a biomechanical laboratory because we want to, uh, what we say should be scientifically proven, and also be proven statistically. Now, when you compare the left skeleton and the right skeleton, the right skeleton corresponds to a person who, at some point in life, almost all people in our latitudes, will one day walk like the skeleton on the right. That's crazy. Then I have exactly the complaints there at the red dots, knees, hips, neck. Exactly. Exactly. And on the right is such an example. I once made videos in the streets of Seoul in Korea. So these are representative pictures of how people walk at an old age. And uh, you ask, what is the effect on all the statics? On the left, you can see that the head is over the shoulders. 
the shoulders over the pelvis and the pelvis over the center of gravity of the knees and the center of gravity of the feet where the feet are placed. Everything in line. And with the skeleton on the right, it's, it's all shifted. And when that shifted, there are shear forces. These are completely different angles and different forces that arise there. The forces on the left are fully in the feet. Everything is on the feet. The feet are designed to be weighted. And now if a person wants to go back to this, so when a person walks like in the picture on the right, and would like to learn to walk like on the left, then that is possible. That's also possible at 80, at, at any age. You can also see changes very quickly. But just wearing our shoes is not enough. That means, of course, you also have to do some stretching exercises, muscle length training, then you have to loosen fascial adhesions. There are also different methods, physiotherapeutic methods. Will I be guided by your shops with this? Yeah, there are small group courses. I run courses myself. I've been in Ticino for a week now, where I gave classes. Or we also have uh, movement scientists employed in our shops, specialists who, who guide it. Our shop staff are also very knowledgeable. Not, not in details, of course, but they, they can help you get started. If we can go back one more time, only briefly on this one, the key to walking physiologically. Maybe you have to go back and return, or, or this, exactly, that's enough. The key to walking like the man on the left is in the feet. If you compare the feet now, the, the two feet, the person on the right has a retracted foot. Indeed. Well, it just folds down. You could, of course, go into biomechanics and see what happens with the heel strike the first time the heel comes into contact with the floor. How do the forces behave? The foot folds down, which gives a huge first blow to the knees. And why is there no blow on the knees on the left picture? Because the feet roll off forcefully, very, very forcefully. And this rolling motion is enforced by this resilient material, which acts like a trampoline. The foot is forced to roll off. And then this won't happen in the knee anymore, because the knee is then also more upright. The pelvis is pushed up. The pelvis then goes into the upright position. Only it can't do that to the same extent as on the left, because the hip flexors, the iliopsoas muscles, the hip flexor muscles are, are not how they used to be. They're, they're shortened from sitting too much, from walking correctly. And then it doesn't quite work. Many people notice that they walk more upright, but then you just have to do additional exercises. If you're looking for an alternative to surgery, then, especially with knee problems, a certain level works very quickly up to the pain relief. But the whole iceberg behind it, and now maybe we could uh, we could go to the next slide, the, the whole iceberg behind, of course, has not yet been resolved. You have to work on it, and if possible, work on it every day. Of course, many surgeons live off people who come with knee pain, hip pain, back pain. Then diagnosis is made with x-rays, with MRI, with computed tomography, and, and then they search. As with mammography, they, they look for where could be something. And then, well, here you have osteoarthritis, or you have some small defect in the meniscus. And we can do something minimally invasive. We can rinse your joint, we can smooth cartilage and so on. And then they operate very quickly. 
operiert. So on the effect level, but never on the cause, because they're still walking around like shit. Exactly. Then they do what you would do with a car. When the red oil lamp flashes, then you say, oh, red oil lamp, that corresponds to the pain for us, right? Pain is the final warning sign. And then you just hit the red bulb. Then it no longer lights up and you keep driving. And that's the same with surgery. There comes one hip and the next hip because all the problems behind it, exactly. There comes one side, the other side. We got it. It's getting faster and faster, faster with every surgery. Here, here we have one, uh, excuse me. Here we have a customer, that one, exactly. She had a surgery. You can see that her right ankle has been stiffened because she had osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis is such a fearful term because, of course, many operating doctors will well, scare you with it. Well, if you don't operate now, it will get worse and worse. That's what was done to her. It would have been nice if she had come before, but also nice for her that she came afterwards. Then she she looked for our solution, and you can you can see her with a, a kaiban or joya shoe on your feet. That's here on the right. On the right, yeah, when she walks. You can hardly see anything anymore. Hardly anything. And she suffered and suffered. I mean, this walk up here, I can see the strain again, the, the hips. This is extreme pain. Then you have relieving postures after relieving postures. The relieving postures are built up in layers. If, if you hit the oil lamp because of pain or because of so-called osteoarthritis, then for the, for the first or for each surgery, a layer of relieving posture is added. And then another area becomes overstressed. Instead of learning to move your feet properly. I'm very impressed when I see the lady on the right now. You can see she walks in a normal way. Yeah. And now the hips are okay too, that there are no new points of information here. Exactly. That means she's a wonderful starting position now, to be able to grow old walking upright without further... Exactly. If in itself, as I said before, our shoes are not a miracle cure, but it is a very, very good help to take a, a giant step forward. And also, in the long run, so our goal that our customers are flexible and pain-free and can stay that way for a lifetime. And that is possible. But of course, you also have to consider the causes. Why did it come to this? You have to address the causes behind it with daily training or uh, changes in behavior. So th this is really possible for a lifetime. You showed me the video before. What I didn't ask is, so this gentleman on the left hasn't had surgery and he's walking on the mat, right? Or has he had surgery? This is a minister from the Philippines who could only walk 100 meters. He has a prosthesis. Okay, hip or where? A, a knee prosthesis, lower leg prosthesis. He heard from us in the Philippines and he came to us. I wanted to explain the, the whole story. We usually take an, an amnesis, just as the doctor does, especially when they come to see me. And then the very first thing I said to him was, he wanted to buy shoes and I ne never let them just do that. I'm scientifically trained and I am interested in the causes and then I'd like to see how to find a solution. First of all, I, I just let him walk on these soft, elastic, springy mats. Those are the, the red ones, the big mats, yes. The same material that we use in our souls. He walked on the mat and, well, you can see, like, day and night, huge difference. Just look at his face filled with joy. Yes, exactly. And that from, from left to right, that's one minute's difference.
A lot can happen there. Can you test it in these shops everywhere if, if you go there? Yeah, we have mats everywhere, different thicknesses, because mats that are too thick can overwhelm you. We have that everywhere. Better to go on such mats before having a surgery and, and test whether the surgery is really necessary or maybe not. Well, I can already tell you that in 9 out of 10 cases, it won't be necessary. You, you probably could... Well, now I have to be a little careful what I say, but I, I'm saying it anyway, as, as I think, I believe that we could save 20% of our health costs. But if we were to save 20 billion in Switzerland, then that would cost a, a lot of jobs and so on. You know, if I would show my mother-in-law this now, this, this video we're doing today, who's looking forward to the next surgery, she wouldn't accept it at all. I'd simply say, dear viewers, just test it. I mean, these shops are there for a reason, where well, you can do a test run. I think you can even rent the shoes temporarily. Just to think about it, is it a purchase that would actually be good for me or not? And when you actually have an operation date and can postpone it, maybe for two or three weeks, to see if that would be an alternative option, great. Preventative measures, I mean. I'd rather use a preventative measure. I'm healthy. But after these convincing episodes, I already know what I'll do afterwards. I want to stay healthy. I want to keep my musculoskeletal system straight. I don't want to risk my knees or hips suffering at some point. Yeah, you know, walking is uh, the most important therapy in old age. So anyway, walking is healthy nutrition. I eat extremely healthy as a, as a self-supporter. I basically only eat sauerkraut. So really emphasis on extreme. Diet is one thing. Movement is the other thing. I get it. And movement becomes more important with age, because I can always change my diet. So when I'm 80 or 70 and I've got cancer, then I can change my diet from one day to the next. I can't change the movement. When I walk on sticks, when I walk on the rollator, I can't just say, now I'm walking because the doctor told me to walk more. I can't just walk anymore. I'm totally dependent on that. And that's why it's important to start preventatively. Yes, it is like that. And with walking with old age, painlessly, be, being able to stay painless and flexible for a long time. I only have to look at one thing at my feet, on the strength, flexibility and balance of the feet. And there are so many studies. One very interesting study about mobility. I don't know, do you know the, the deep squat when you squat down all the way with your feet flat? What they say in Asia is when you can't do this squat anymore, then death isn't far away. There are also studies about it. There's a study, a, a Brazilian study with 2,000 patients that life expectancy, of course, everything is in the hands of God, he decides, right? But the chance is, statistically, you live longer when... If you want to get up from lying down, the less help you need with your hands, or even without momentum, you can get up. Well, I can get up from the supine position without using my hands. Nothing, even without momentum, just slowly. And this agility that only works when the feet work to get up, the feet are not only crucial for walking for a long time, but also to maintain the quality of life in old age. And a surgery doesn't help. 
On the contrary, it makes you even more immobile. Yeah, I got it. I'm now 52 and I also notice how much my musculoskeletal system has decreased through a lot of sitting. And I'll change that. I've now started trampolining every day. Yeah, trampolines are great. And if I wear the trampoline principle in my shoes, of course, I do another workout. Super cool. I don't want to experience anymore that my knees hurt or that I can no longer get up the mountain because it hurts. I'm way too young for that. So I think what you say is very important. Thank you very much. Now, one more question. I see a lot of athletes jogging on concrete. And when I ask this question now, I mean, it's the same principle, concrete. There are blows, the blows are dramatic for the knees and hips. This is actually the beginning of an inflammatory cascade, isn't it? Or the wear and tear. Now you've raised so many issues, I have to think about where to start. We could do a double episode. Yeah, there is something in the, in the background in movement science, what's behind it. There are so many things behind it. I, I mentioned behind it, if you already notice at 52, certain things no longer work, so there's already a pain, there's already the last warning signal, but it actually starts in schools. Personally, I think it's criminal what's done with our children in elementary school. Sit and be quiet. Then they have to sit and be quiet. I mean, there's the subject of ADD, ADHD. The medication that's being given, ah, that's another issue, isn't it? But children want to move that, and that children have to sit it's so bad. Also, orthopedically, children with 10 years of age are pre-programmed with all the problems that come later in old age. If you compare 10 and 12-year-old children to five, six-year-old children before they go to school, test the agility. It's as different as day and night. The mobility decreases massively because in preschool age children, they sit on the floor, they move freely. And at the age of 12, there are already problems. I would say that, but that's not scientific. 30, 40 percent of the total problems are already there. These are muscle imbalances. These are fascial adhesions. Fascial adhesions also lead to insecurity. Stability decreases steadily with age, with every adhesion that's added somewhere. And that starts with muscle imbalances. It just begins with the movement in the feet. Uh, and none of that hurts yet. At 40, 80% of the iceberg of problems of old age are not visible. Exactly. Completely invisible. I can run to pick up the subject, ride a bike, run. Nordic walking would be a special topic. Nordic walking. Uh, not good either. Uh, not on the concrete, right? Uh, yeah, I don't want to just say a catastrophe in general. But then I'd also like to be able to explain that uh, why that doesn't make sense to me. Or only makes limited sense, I have to say. But all of these sports, I'm also very active in the field of sports, alternatives. Also in top sport, professional sports alternatives. FC St. Gallen also works with you. We are very strongly involved in top class sport. With the Kyben Park, with the namesake of a stadium. There is a term that says sports are murder. Yeah. And so jogging on hard floors, these are monotonous movements. And we know that from fascia research, there's a professor, Dr. Robert Schleip, who is leading in Europe, with whom I also actually have a connection. He says he found out that 
monotonous movements, always the same movements, that this sticks the fascia together. For example, what makes fasciae stick together is everything that supports. In soles or a cast, the best example. If you put a joint in a cast for six weeks, then you take the cast off and the joint is stiff. Every movement hurts, hurts enormously. Every movement that I make with my elbow after six weeks. Because of fascia. Because the fasciae are stuck together, yeah. And fasciae stick together because they don't move. So the worst cast is the chair. It sticks together my fascia. When you're a little older and then get up, which I don't do now because of the camera, then first you have to loosen the fascial adhesions again. They stick together very quickly. Or if you drive a car longer, the older you are, the, the faster the fasciae stick together. So a joint gets stuck when it's not moved. And if I don't finish a movement, unfinished movements in the foot by not walking on natural ground. We only make unfinished movements, the tibialis anterior, so the tibial muscle here. It's not used to lifting the foot properly. It would do that on uneven ground, on natural ground. It just lets go on the flat floor. The concentric load on the tibialis is eliminated if it's not moved. It becomes stiff. There are so many adhesions in there. Fascial adhesions lead to immobility. Now, I've lost the thread. These are all invisible things. The, the tip of the iceberg. And the pain, it has to be taken very, very seriously. And not just to go for surgery, but to ask, what do I have to change? But, like you say, our customers are... They, they're people who think one step further, who also try to find the cause, and don't just expect an injection from the doctor, or, dear doctor, please make me well, but who are also aware that health is a great grace of God. That's probably the most important thing. But you can also do something about it. Personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. Wearing shoes, wearing elastic, springy shoes already helps a lot. But there is a lot more involved. Working on agility, loosening fascial adhesions, this iceberg behind it, which is invisible and which you can no longer even feel when it no longer hurts. Still having the awareness to continue working on this iceberg, then it's really possible without surgery. Hopefully without surgery, because it destroys a lot to remain flexible and pain-free for a lifetime. And if I come back to this jogger again, if they were to jog on shoes, for example, where this spring, this trampoline principle is contained, then they don't harm, do they? Of course, of course. This, this is, of course, completely different. But they need the explanation. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah, so jogging. I, I wondered a bit. I haven't finished here. I'm glad you said it again. This monotonous movement, always the same movement, the foot simply falls down, falls down. Jogging is a monotonous movement. Cycling is a wonderful sport. To enjoy the landscape and very good for cardiac health. Nothing against jogging. Jogging is also great for the cardiovascular system. Nordic walking is also great for the cardiovascular system. The question is, what is it for orthopedics? So, for the musculoskeletal system. And when I do a sport that's at the expense of the musculoskeletal system, and I am aware that it's at the expense of the health of the musculoskeletal system in the third, the most beautiful phase of life, where one would have time to hike, go on city trips and so on. Then I have to ask myself whether I shouldn't change the sport 
for example, to go jogging barefoot on a natural track, or barefoot everywhere, or where it's not possible, wear shoes that have this elastic springy principle built in. Because every step is different, because trampolines, trampolining is the best there is for humans. Because it activates all muscles, it balances the whole body. And to walk balanced, or jog balanced is very different from just these monotonous movements that we often make in everyday life. Monotonous movements, no movement and stress are all adhesive. And in the case of health, an over-acidic diet and over-acidic environment also makes the fasciae stick together. I was just a, a guest at the Swiss Mountain Clinic with uh, Dr. Wiechel. And there I see all the people walking around with these health shoes. I didn't even think about it. I'm pleased. And when I recently talked about knee problems, they brought me a trampoline. But everyone's walking around with your shoes on. Now I see more and more how it all works together, also in medicine, especially there. But I'd, I'd like to use the situation right away and let a gifted doctor speak for whom I have the utmost respect, namely Professor Hecht. I'd like to briefly include his quote again in this episode, which, by the way, will be a double episode. You've already noticed that the time is already up, but I can't stop because it's just so important. Let, let's listen to this. It's like walking on moss, like on carpet, and the feet are massaged. They don't hurt. There's no pain in my feet at all. What is the best thing about this shoe? The shoe adapts to the foot, while otherwise the foot has to adapt to the shoes. And so that's the big advantage. That was from the last episode. But we'll leave that in there now, because what he says is so great. I know the man well. He says he goes to the park in Berlin for an hour in the morning and another hour in the evening. He's 97 today and he's walking incredibly well. And so happy. And I just think that's important that we hear that from the medical side too. He's someone who really focuses on the causes of a patient and not just the effects. Ah, there's a problem. Here we go. So I just wanted to show that. I have another question. I come from a shoe dynasty and, of course, had to suffer... My father always looked at me as a boy. Walk forward, I look closely at your heels. So, and when I wasn't walking straight and always rolled slightly, I had to wear special shoes, really. Everyone had sneakers with three stripes, and I was the only one who had to somehow wear those loafers. And that was terrible. But I'm walking well today. My soles, when you look at them, are worn off very clean. So when I look at young people today as they walk, then I hardly see anyone walking straight but always either with the heels or the front turned to the side. That must actually be the iceberg for the entire musculoskeletal system that I don't see. Yeah, if you don't go barefoot in nature, then malfunctions are always involved. So it's always unnatural. Your father's shoes too. It's very noble that he taught you the rolling motion properly, but the shoes probably had heels, and you probably walked on flat ground too. Sure, but if you walk consciously, you can even do that with normal shoes, so you don't even need our shoes. If you pay attention to the rolling motion, Make sure that you put your feet firmly on the ground and that you put your weight on them properly, slightly at the back on the outside, very, very light. This can, of course, also be supination, which would then be dangerous. And then forcefully roll over the big toe. Then you can do that without our shoes. You just have to think about it every single step. It doesn't work automatically. I was forced to walk like this because it had a straight sole, a heavy one, like a, like a hiking shoe. I couldn't roll back or front at all. 
Well, I'm not sure if that was a good thing or not. It was my father's wish and I had to do it. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was good or bad. It probably has raised your awareness for shoes and walking properly. So at least there is the awareness. But if that was the right way, uh, no offence to your father, but I would probably need to know more about it. I can imagine, but how is it now when you walk behind people and, and see that they roll off in the back or in front? Is that an alarm signal? Should people react to these situations? That in itself is not an alarm signal. You put your foot down without force. And when I let my foot hang like that, it always goes outside, so like that. And, and that's why the heels wear out at the back, because the foot hangs down outwards. What's important is what it does when force is involved. So when it's preloaded by the tibia muscle and weighted with force, how do I weight then? Do I fall backwards into overpronation, as with flat feet, for example? Or can I keep my foot supinated? It's crucial. If you are already walking passively, then it doesn't really matter where and how the shoe wears out. Well, and in the end, we are still all at this point where we have to wonder what situation we are in. Exactly. And here you can see that the foot rolls off forcefully. The strength is crucial. And then, of course, if it starts on the outside, it starts going inside like a flat foot from the start. That is, of course, not good because then more and more knock knees develop. And on the other hand, more and more people develop bow legs in the course of life. But that is also correctable. When you learn to move your foot correctly, so physiologically, Knock knees and bow legs also have an impact on my posture of the knees and the hips. Knock knees and bow legs result from the strain on the feet. If you have the skeleton, with a skeleton, you can put it as you want, knock knees or bow legs. This is given by the muscles, by the automation of the gait, that is, on your feet. Small children have, if it's not a big defect, a, a birth defect, then they have neither knock knees nor bow legs. Then the leg axis is correct. It develops in the course of life in terms of gait pattern. And the gait pattern certainly has something to do with the genes, but it also has to do with the place where I go. So how early do I get shoes with heels, which is poison? And that's about the worst thing you can have, heels under your heel. Because then the mobility of the ankles is lost. Ideally, the shin should be able to look forward about 45 degrees. Less than 40 degrees is degenerative. And then you get knock knees or bow legs. But that can be corrected again. I have many customers who have seen the leg axis straighten out again. I'm amazed. I found another reference here. I'd like to hear what he says. Who is this gentleman? I don't know him personally. We may have videos from around 800 customers. His name is Mr. Engler. He could hardly walk for half an hour with sticks. And now he goes painless. I think he's over 80 too. Well, let's listen to him. I wouldn't have thought that a shoe would do so much, but it really does. And I recommend it to everyone, especially older people who have problems walking. Buy those shoes. Yeah, of course, that is incredibly authentic. If you can see that, people can then walk around painlessly. So really great. I've, I find this whole topic incredibly exciting because we're getting back to the basics of all natural medicine.
So far, it's been completely neglected in my station. And that's why it's really a great story for you to tell us. And how many surgeries could be prevented by that if we gave ourselves a chance? Now, I have another question. If the viewers say, that interests me, I'd like to test it. I'd like to see how it is before and after, test for two weeks or walk on such a map before I have a surgery. Where can they find out what they have to do? Um, you find that the best advice is available in the Kaiban Joya shops. These are health shops. They, they're called Kaiban Joya shops. There are around seven in Switzerland. Then there are some in Barcelona, in Rome, in Germany, in Switzerland, in St. Gallen, Arbonne. Uh, but you can find the whole list on the internet. Back again, just a, a sentence on the subject of natural medicine. Yeah, it is true that natural medicine doesn't only consist of nutrition. It has a, a very, very high priority. That is very, very important. But I believe in movement is equally important. And not just moving, but the quality of movement. And the best exercise is trampolining. It's no coincidence that there is a trampoline in front of almost every single family house. But more and more older people are also joining to have these mini tramps at home where you can hold in front. Yeah, great. This is so great. Everyone loves a trampoline. It's just this elastic, bouncy movement that gets you into weightlessness for a, a fraction of a second. The body weight or the feeling for the body weight. That changes constantly, overload, underload, and that's also incredibly good for the formation of cartilage, just uh, according to Wolf's Law, that describes that. And, uh, of course, for osteoporosis too. And we always need both, nutrition with the right vitamin components and the exercise, the good quality movement, the natural movement, together, this makes up natural medicine, the psyche, so the stress. That would be another topic, but trampoline movement also relieves stress. There's a term that's internal stress. I came across it in Asia. The internal stress, these are tense muscles, which then also affects the organs the organ activity. So when you're stressed, it goes into your stomach too. Then your digestion doesn't work that well. And well, stress is an interesting topic, which has an enormous impact on natural medicine, whether you have a, a lot or a little or no stress. If we stick with sports again for a bit, would you also say for all of our viewers at home, whether uh, whether they're 10 years old or 80 years old, it's never too late to start trampolining at home. Trampolining is the best thing you can do. I just started now at 69 to learn backflips and somersaults again. I still have the courage. I was able to do that before. But... Yeah, I, I want to learn that again now, also for the cardiovascular system, for coordination. And I'm going to be able to do that this year. But trampolining is best for the cardiovascular system, for the musculoskeletal system. There is no better exercise than trampolining. I now do it for half an hour every morning. I'm soaked in sweat. Great. I'm so unfit, but that's changing now. Great. We really have heard enough preventative measures now. Dear viewers, I just find it incredibly meaningful to take precautions before we are in pain anywhere or illness finds its way somewhere, let alone some kind of surgery may or may not have to be done. And the people who actually are in pain already, I can only wish that you just test it. Start the attempt before you get surgery, with unbelievable further consequences. I heard further with surgeries, the fascia also break. It's just logical, it makes sense. And it's also clear that it won't all fit back together as it was before. 
Well, dear viewers, that was a special episode that went on for almost an hour, and every single minute was worth it. Thank you very much for watching. And you, dear Carl, again, you are my hero. You taught me a lot. And I don't know how many people are just grateful that they could ultimately prevent an operation and walk painlessly. This is something that is just an honor. And for that, I thank you very much. Thank you, Alexander. All the best, dear viewers, and we'll see you next time.